Hey there everybody. In this video, we're learning Newton's third law, which is probably the most misunderstood law in all of physics. Basically, Newton's third law is all about force pairs. And the big idea here is that forces always occur in pairs. You can't ever have a single force. There's always two forces. To kind of expand on that a little bit, whenever there's a force exerted on an object, which we might refer to as an action force, then that object is going to exert a force on whatever caused that force, and typically we call that a reaction. So, for example, you might push a box. Notice that we do this a lot in physics. So there's you, there's the box, there's the force that you exert on the box. So I'm going to label that F box, comma, U. So the force is on the box. You are the thing causing it. The reaction to that is that the box pushes you back. And so I'm going to call that F U on the box. So force on U due to the box. This is the action. This is the reaction. You can never have a force without a reaction force. And so you can't ever push on a box without having the box push you back. That's the rule. Reaction forces are always equal to the reaction, or to the action rather, and they are exerted in the opposite direction. So if the force you exert on the box is 20 newtons, then the reaction force on you is going to be 20 newtons. When you push a box to the right, it's going to push you to the left. And so back in middle school at some point, you may have learned to recite that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, this is what it means. When you push on something, it pushes back with the same size force, but in the opposite direction. So more than being able to recite that, we need to understand what it means and then apply it to different situations. Now the terms action and reaction are pretty much arbitrary. It doesn't really matter what we call the action force and what we call the reaction force. It's kind of dependent on your point of view. Both forces occur simultaneously. So it's not like you push the box and then it pushes you back. The box starts pushing you back the instant that you begin pushing it. And so the action could just as easily have been considered the box pushing you rather than you pushing the box. It doesn't really matter which one is which. So here's a question for you. What's the reaction force to your weight? So you have weight, so force pulling you downward. What is the reaction force to it? So there's you. There is your weight. The thing we have to remember is that gravity, which is what your weight is, is caused by the Earth. So there's the Earth, and there is the reaction force. So when the Earth pulls you downwards, you pull the earth up. Now the reason that we don't notice that is because the earth is a lot bigger than you are. And so its acceleration is really, really small. Speaking of, let's look at another simple example. Suppose that we have a 100 kilogram man in space. You might call that a spaceman. And he throws a 20 kilogram space rock. As a result, the man accelerates to the left at 1 meter per second squared. So there's a reaction force on the man caused by the space rock, and so he's going to accelerate backwards. The question is, what is the acceleration of the rock? So there's my system, the spaceman and the rock. I drew the rock blue because in space, rocks are blue. And I'm going to draw a free body diagram for each of them. I'm going to kind of draw it on just those dots down there so that my diagram is easier to read. So there's the man pushing the rock forward to the right. As a result, the man gets pushed to the left. Now I know that the net force on the man 
is equal to mass times acceleration. And so he's accelerating at a rate of 1 meter per second squared. So the force on him is directed to the left, and it has a size of 100 newtons. I also know that the acceleration of the rock can be found by dividing the force on the rock by the mass. And I also know that the mass is 20 kilograms, and that the force on it is the same as the force on the man. So that's the important thing that we have to remember, is that this number is the same as this number. And so it should make sense that you get a bigger acceleration for the rock. It's in the opposite direction. He pushed it to the right. Um, and it should make sense that it is larger, since it is smaller than the man. So here's the next question that you might want to think about. So after this man pushes the rock, once he lets go of the rock, he's going to stop accelerating, but he's going to keep moving. That's Newton's first law. So the next question is, how does this man stop himself? Remember, he's in space. So just a question to kind of ponder for next time in class. The next thing we want to be able to do with Newton's second law, or Newton's third law, excuse me, is use it to analyze a system of objects. The question we just looked at was a system of objects. So we want to be able to use Newton's third law to analyze system of objects. A system is two or more objects which are interacting with each other. And so the previous example, the spaceman and the space rock, made up a system. In physics, objects are interacting with each other through forces. You can't do anything to something else without exerting some sort of force on it. So, real simple example. Suppose that you pull a rope and on a box, sorry, and it causes it to accelerate to the right. So, real simple picture. There's you, there's the box. So, the system is you and the box. And you pull it to the right and it's going to pull you to the left. And so the third law tells us that the tension in the box, on the box is the same as the tension on you. That's what Newton's third law tells us. Those two forces have the same magnitude and in the opposite direction. The other thing to notice is that since the objects are connected, they're going to have the same acceleration. It would be really weird if you took off running while pulling a rope attached to something and it didn't keep up with you. That's the purpose of the rope. And so we can always, when two things are connected like this, say that they're going to have the same acceleration. So let's look at a more uh, numeric example. Suppose we have a three kilogram block that this rests on a table. We attach a two kilogram block to it by a string that passes over a pulley and then we're going to let the 2 kilogram block hang down. So the picture might look something like that. And then the question is, first of all, what's the acceleration of those blocks? And second, what is the tension in the string? So, first step in any force problem is still to draw a free body diagram. And so I'm going to call the 3 kilogram object 1 and the 2 kilogram object object 2 just so that I can kind of keep things straight. So on object one, it's got weight pulling it down, normal force pushing upwards on it, and then the rope pulls it to the right. On object two, it's also got weight pulling it down. Please draw these to scale. That should be bigger than that, since it's got more mass, more weight. And then the rope should be pulling it upwards. Please draw these. The scale. These should be the same size since Newton's third law tells us that the tension is the same. The next step is to write a net force equation. Since I have two objects, I'm going to write two net force equations. And I'm only going to write a net force equation in the direction that they're accelerating. So I'm going to write net force on object 1 in the x direction. The only net force on object 1 is the tension, and so just equals T. 
and the net force in the x-direction on object 2, we may go, there's no x-forces on object 2. They're both just up and down. But the thing that we're going to do is we're going to tilt our x-axis to match the direction of the acceleration. So we're going to say the net force in the x-direction on object 2 is equal to the weight minus tension. And so that way, we don't have to like switch axes when we go from one object to another. We're just going to make x always follow the string. So x is to the right for object 1, x is to the um, down for object 2. So third step, always, is to apply Newton's second law. Remember, Newton's second law simply means acceleration is equal to the net force over the mass. So rewriting my two net force equations, instead of writing net force x1, I'm just going to write m1a, still equals t, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the net force in um, the x-direction object 2. Just write ma2, or m2a, sorry. So again, remember that the acceleration is the same because they're both connected. So basically, we're solving for this a. It's the same a in both equations. So since I have two equations involving two unknowns, as the tension's also an unknown, we need to solve this um, system of equations using one of the methods of solving system of equations we learned in Algebra 2. The best method in this case, and in most cases, um, is elimination eliminate one of the variables that is unknown. And so because the tension is positive in one equation and negative in the other, that would be a really easy method to use. So that just means take the two equations, write them over each other like that, so that you can add them together. When you add those equations together, t plus minus t cancels out. On the left side, just write it exactly like it appears, m1a plus m2a. And then on the right side, the only thing that's left is the weight of object 2. So when you add those two equations together, it looks something like that. Since we're solving this for a, there's an a there and there's an a there, the next step would be to um, factor that a out of the left side of the equation. So like write it like that and then divide both sides by the m1 plus m2 so that it looks like that. So once we get to this point right here, it's just a matter of solving that equation for a. So when we do that, remember that the force of gravity is equal to m times g and so the weight of object 2 is 20 newtons. So I'm just going to plug that in, substitute in my two masses, 3 kilograms and 2 kilograms. And so that would be 20 over 5, which would be 4, and then the unit would be meters per second squared. So when you let those things go, they're both going to have an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. If it was asking about just object 1, then you would say it's accelerating to the right. About object 2, you would say it's accelerating downward. Now let's take a second just to consider the equation that we got and ask ourselves if that seems reasonable. Remember the picture looks something like this. The only thing that's applying force to this system is the weight of object 2. The weight of object 1 was balanced by a normal force. And so the fact that the only thing providing a force is object 2 should make sense. The fact that both masses are resisting acceleration, and so they should show up on bottom, should also make sense. We can't just get rid of object 3. It's going to slow things down. And, or excuse me, object two, 1. Object 1 is still going to slow things down, so it makes sense that it still shows up in the equation. So basically what we've done is we've showed that for this system, the acceleration of the system is equal to the net force on the system over the mass of the system. 
which is kind of another way to approach it. And hopefully, that makes sense. The more mass in the system, the lower its acceleration. The more force in the system, the greater the acceleration. Okay, so we still have one thing left in this problem, and that's figuring out the tension. We've done all the hard stuff. Now all we've got to do is figure out the tension using either of our net force equations. I would recommend use the simplest one, the one that doesn't have a plus or minus the tension in it. And so all I've got to do now is substitute in mass 1 and the acceleration we got. And the tension will be something like 12 newtons. Last thing to note on this problem is that because the tension is a force that's between two objects that are in our system, we can call it an internal force, meaning it's going to be eliminated ultimately from our net force equation when we find the acceleration. And so any internal force, meaning the action and reaction is on objects that are part of the system, that's going to happen too. They're going to cancel out when we um, eliminate them finding the acceleration. Okay, so here's a list of the things we need to be able to do once we get ADAPT using Newton's third law. First thing is identify force pairs between objects. So you push on something, tell me what the reaction force is. Set force pairs equal to each other. Recognize when that happens, basically. Know that they're going to give you the same number of Newtons. And then third, eliminate internal forces to find the acceleration of a system. So those are the three things we need to be able to do by the end of class next time. Speaking of class next time, that's the end of this video. I'll see you then. Ta-ta.